things along the way. Uh, I, I had this moment um, this winter. I don't know if you've had these moments in your life. And uh, my body started to feel, uh, you know, a little bit achy and a little bit sluggish and a little bit tired. Anybody had one of those seasons where you're like, what's going on? Um, and uh, despite maybe thinking that's just what getting old is, uh, I had this strange thought. You know, you get this thought, like, what? Maybe I should go back to the gym. I know. Like, I don't want to get crazy this morning. It's still early. Maybe I should go back to the gym. And um, so as I was thinking through uh, that whole process, they have like this test day where you can go back. And I was like, okay, no harm, no foul. So I go back to the gym. Uh, and, and let me just stop there. Before I go back to the gym, let me just say there's a lot about the gym I don't like. All right? Like I don't like being sore the next day. You feel great in the moment. You wake up. And how am I stumbling? I heard like an amen over here. Like, yes, that, that feeling of like I can barely walk. Um, I, I don't like the la- really loud grunting uh, that happens in the gym. Like, sometimes I'm not lifting heavy stuff, but I feel like I just need, like, just to be part of the culture. Like, just, yeah, like, that was big. Like, this 10-pounder was tough. Uh, And then also, like, there's always a guy with a gallon water bottle walking around, you know, and just, like, no problem here. He's, you know, got eight machines going. I don't know what the rhythm is here. And it just, it always feels like the next day of going back to school. Like, I survived fourth grade, but I don't know if I can do fifth grade. Like, that's what I feel when anybody else get these vibes, or is it just me? Okay, so, so those are like gym vibes for me. And so I pushed through that first day. And let me just tell you, I'm feeling good at the end of that. You know, you get that adrenaline flowing a little bit, and you're like, oh, man, this is great. Where's this been my whole life? Uh, and then I hit this moment where I walk out of the gym. And this, this smell of heaven is wafting down from across the parking lot. And like this right here, this, this, this image is immediately what hits me. And there are these three things that are the villains in my life. Whataburger, in and out and then Krispy Kreme. Like, the, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So these are within just seconds of me walking out. And I'm like, oh, the testing has begun. All right. And so uh, I, I walk out and I literally have to drive the gauntlet because I have to go between Whataburger and in and out I know there's a big rivalry. I'm not here to settle that today, but I have to drive through that. And then I'm like, okay, I made it. And then Krispy Kreme is just waiting for me. Delicious carbs that melt in your mouth. Uh, and so I, I actually um, have to confess, I woke up this morning and I hit the Googles. And dear Lord... Here in Cherry Hill, there actually is a Krispy Kreme. Um, I may have a problem. Just saying. Like, um, so the, I started my morning. I started my morning right with with a little Krispy Kreme. Uh, and so I, I've worked through my issues. Uh, I have I have some problems, don't we all? Um, guys, I I have been back in the gym for several months. Uh, and I have resisted the urge many days, not all days, but many days to push against Krispy Kreme. Come on. Can I get a little, little bit of love? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This morning I decided to indulge uh, in that. Guys, any time we want to make a change, expect resistance. Feels good for a second? Yeah, I can do this until that thing. It's, you just expect it. You want to change in your life? Just expect resistance. And I'm kind of in the change business, which is strange. As a leadership coach to amazing leaders across the country, like Earn, nonprofit and business and church, and people who love Jesus and are like, I, I want to pull out the greatness in me. Like, I want to leverage everything in me so that I can impact other people. And that's, that's what we're asking, right? It's like, how do I actually change how do, how do I move? Like, it is one of the hardest things that we'll ever do. And in fact, billions of dollars a year are spent in the change industry. Change this about the way you look, about the way you feel, about your career, about this moment, this season. And it is one of the hardest things that we will do. And I have just always been fascinated by these two questions. How do people change? And then the other side of this, why do we not change when we want to? Why do we not change? I, I'm just trying to get healthy here. I'm just trying to lose a few pounds just so I can have energy. And then Krispy Kreme. <laughs> right? I'm just trying to push against this, but I don't know. Maybe I'll wait a year or two or three or five. I don't, maybe not right now. What isn't happening 
inside of us. Like, how can I change my habits? How can I change these things so I can have this huge impact on the world? And let me just say, guys, we're all trying to do that in some way. You're not alone in that. But there's this passage in Scripture that sounds like it could be something that's on a meme, sounds like it could be something that we say every day. This is in the book of Romans. It says, I do not understand what I do. Anybody identify that? For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, ooh. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That's a whole lot of doo-doo in that verse, right? There's a whole lot of doing going on in, in that, why don't I do this? And then I want to do this. Ah, oh, like anybody feel that? That tension inside of us. Why do I get trapped? Why is it so hard to change? And this old adage says, we don't change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Pain. I hate to tell you, but pain is part of the process. I haven't learned to escape it. I'm at the age in life where I don't have to do anything to injure myself. Can anybody identify? Like, oh, why am I sore? Because I got a good night's sleep last night. Like, like, what happened? Did I wrestle something in my sleep? Like, what is, what is happening? Neither here nor there, right? But like, oh, man. And uh, I started to, to have some little pains and, you know, places, places in my body. And uh, what I realized was that it actually wasn't that place that was causing the pain. It was somewhere else. And I learned about this now friend called the chiropractor. Anybody been to a chiropractor? It's like a strange situation. They're cracking your body, and it, it hurts so good, and it's, it's so helpful. And I've learned that many times where the pain starts is not the problem. It's actually somewhere else, and our body is out of alignment, out of alignment. You feel like, oh, I have a leg issue. It's actually maybe something off in your hip. I have something going on in my back. It could be something in your neck. And it turns out we're all connected. And when something is out, we feel the pain. Maybe the pain you're feeling in your life is because something else is off in another area. Maybe something else is off in your family. And you're saying, man, I, I just can't produce at work like I could before. Maybe something is off over here in your motivation or an insecurity that's driving you to do something, and then it's off over here in relationships. And as I was getting cracked by this large man who's over me, who says, put your body in a pretzel position, I'm going to put all of my weight on you and do something like that. In that moment, guys, teacher, let me just say this, teachers are strange, strange humans. Because I'm like, oh, here's an analogy right here. And I thought, maybe pain is actually a good thing, inviting me to pay attention to something else. Maybe there's something out of alignment in our lives. Jesus is having this open air conversation. This open air conversation, as he often did these conversations that break out and start, and I would have loved to be there for this conversation. But in the book of Mark, it goes like this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Here's this picture of alignment, of putting all these things in order, heart, soul, mind, body, relationships. Yes, amen. Heart, soul, mind, body, relationships. When all these things are working together in alignment, it's very different than one of them where something is missing. I like this definition of aligned. It says to come into precise adjustment. To come into precise adjustment. What? is off just a twinge in your life and causing pain in another area. There are two people in the Bible who are feeling this pain. And, and I've never seen these two stories next to each other. And several months ago, I was just reading through and going, oh man, here are two people feeling pain, but they were both given an invitation. 
an invitation. So we could call this the tale of two invitations. One of them is in the book of Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short. I'm not throwing shade to anyone who's short. He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. It's as if he's saying this is the exact person the exact encounter, the kind of growth and hunger and drive and chutzpah that I want for somebody to be able to change. That's what he's saying right here. And what's really interesting is he invites himself into Jesus's life, ironically, by inviting himself over to his house. Now, I know what you're thinking. I have that friend who has the ministry of inviting himself over to my house, and it's not a ministry. It is a curse, right? I'm not talking about the guy that shows up 30 minutes early or unannounced randomly. Hey, what are, you, what are you doing here? Right? Like the ministry of inviting himself over. But can you imagine if, if this hero, the, the one that everybody wants to be around, invites himself into his life? And look at the response. Immediately, I'll give half of, of anything to the poor. If I've cheated anyone, I'll make it right. Like I'm here to change. I love the hunger. He does anything. He climbs a tree without a harness to get to Jesus. Like that's the hunger. And we see the invitation right there. And then there's another case that starts really similar. This is in the book of Mark. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Do you feel the hunger? Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, here we go again. The same thing's unfolding. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. First of all, really? Secondly, he's like, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, how how do we get to the other stuff? Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This is one of the saddest passages in all of scripture for me. Like just a deep sadness. Now this man, likely Jewish, likely between 22 and 40. He had social power because there was old money in his family and he had a prestige with that. He was wealthy, but he's feeling a pain in his life. He's saying, I've got a pain somewhere in my life and he comes to Jesus with that. And also, let me be clear, these two passages are not actually about money. They're about affection. We're not talking about money here. We're talking about these two, men hearts, these two men's hearts, and Jesus sees it. This is not about their bank accounts, their net worth. This is not about their portfolios, their last paycheck. This is about their hearts. And we see Jesus wants their hearts. Guys, this rich young man believed he was stuck. Believed he couldn't change. How many times do we believe that we're stuck? This is just the way it's always going to be. We can always fall back into that. Where do you believe your life is unchangeable? Unhealable, unmovable, unshiftable. You can't say no to this thing. You can't say yes to this thing. And some of you need to be reminded of this freedom. Even Jesus, the savior of the world, let people walk away. And some of you want so badly for somebody else to change that you're working harder on their life than they're willing to work. Mm -hmm. 
In 2 Corinthians, there's this small verse that gives us so much life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Not only at the moment we receive Jesus, we're a new creation, but every day we're becoming a new creation. Becoming a new creation. We, we turn over old habits to Jesus, and then over the years we say, maybe just maybe I'm maturing a little bit. And this is commonly called a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Somebody with a fixed mindset says, this is the way it's going to be. This is the family I've come from. This is the situation I've come from. These are the things that I'm predisposed to. This is my life. You don't understand. That's not going to change. A growth mindset says, I believe that I can change. I can learn. I can grow. Guys, Ernest is one of the hungriest leaders I have ever met. And it is a joy. And he says, what do I need to, to know? How do, I, how do I learn? How do I grow? And he does because he's driven on this mission to Cherry Hill and the ends of the earth, Accelerate City. God is doing beautiful things here. He wants it. He's so hungry, and that's easy to work with. One of my favorite quotes says this, Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into your mind. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, your longings. What are your wants, your loves, and your longings? If it were as easy as just knowing our intellect is informed, first of all, preaching would be really easy and really short. Church would be like six minutes long, great to see you. You know, quick hand clap, and we're out of here, right? We'd have 17 services here, and, and we'd be gone quickly. We'd all be super healthy. We'd all be wealthy. We'd all have supportive friends in our lives, no toxic relationships. We'd be working the perfect amount. Uh, turns out it's not that easy. And I want you guys to picture like there's a string that's attached from our heart to our hands, to our, our thumb as we scroll and purchase things on Amazon that are so quickly to get delivered to our house so quickly. Uh-oh, sounds like I, I might have hit an accord here. We'll talk about that later here on the front row. Um, but there, there's this string, right, to, to our hands and to our hearts and to where we go and to what we do because it's about our affections, the things that we fixate on, the things that we scroll past. And I'll tell you guys, there are podcasts that I've had to quit on because they are actually shifting my affections and my desires. There are shows that I've had to quit on. There are relationships that I've had to pull back from because that is actually shaping my affections, and I don't like it. Here are a couple of reminders for you, but I want to start with this, guys. I wish this wasn't true, but only the hungry change. Only the hungry change. Like, I can't want you bad enough to change and just want you into it. Only the hungry change. Maybe it's not the moment, the person, or the season. We can pray for other people to change. But let me give you this, a couple of markers that people are ready to change. The three H's I call them. Number one, humility. Two, hunger. And three, honesty. Some markers, not foolproof, but if you sense a genuine humility in somebody and then a hunger and then an honesty, say what's actually going on, I wanna work with that person. I wanna spend time with that person. Now the other side of that, some markers were unwilling to change. The opposite of that, pride. Apathy and self-protection. I'm pr protecting something in here. Would people describe you as the first set or the second set? I think an honest question, and maybe the answer is depends on what area. Are we talking about the gym here? Or are we talking about my giving habits here or lack thereof? Are we talking about how I serve? And I'll just tell you, like, our time, we protect that so, so carefully. And maybe for somebody else, it's different. You're likely to volunteer, but you're not as likely over here to offer up information or to challenge. I don't, I don't know what that is for you, but there's this beautiful thing that when there's a new awareness in our lives, like we realize something needs to change, then invites us to new action. Sometimes there's a new awareness in our lives and like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not hungry enough to change. It doesn't hurt enough. But new awareness that Jesus cultivates should always lead to a new action in our lives. And I'll share 
later on about some things that I'm not so proud of. It took me a while to pay attention to. Now, I'll be honest, even in the change business where I'm coaching people through change and it takes a while and it doesn't happen just in a moment with most of these things, I still want quick fixes. Anybody else? Amazon Prime World, right? Like, I, I want it now. I want it two weeks ago, actually. As I'm working out, I'm feeling good. I'm walking out of the gym swole, and then I can't walk for two days, all right? I go to the chiropractor, and he's like, okay, so this was good, but you're actually going to need to stretch, and you're actually going to need to sort of change your relationship with your body. And I'm like, oh, I didn't want that. Counseling, I, like one session, are we good now? Oh, we barely had your intake form filled out, son. Like, no, okay, we'll see you back here a lot. We need three things. When we're thinking about change, a new mindset, a new skill set, and a new tool set. Now, Stephen Covey talks about those, that, that maybe your mind is shifting, and I want to invite you, like, you're going to need to learn new skills. What does that mean? It'd be like writing with your left hand or if you're a southpaw with your right hand, brushing your teeth, like the littlest things that, yeah, I've got it, are so awkward when we learn a new skill. That's all of us. We're learning a new skill, a new way of life. That's okay. That's part of it. And then a new tool set. I'm a big fan of tools because we can keep using those tools and keep practicing. Those, I don't know where we got the idea that change is supposed to happen right now, in this moment, forever, with no work. I don't know what book that was in, I wish it were true, it's just not. But let me give you a warning about change. Some other people in our lives don't actually want us to get healthy and whole. And here's the bad news. Sometimes I don't even want myself to get healthy and whole. Whereas we are built for stasis. We're built for for self-protection. We're built for safety. And our brains are saying, don't do this. Don't shift. Don't change. Our, our friends, our family of origin, people around us actually don't like the fact that we're getting healthy because it may make them feel insecure. And, and I just want to warn you. How many times it's like, oh, I, I came to know Jesus and I thought my life would, would get easier. Where's the easy verse? I've been looking for it in scripture. Maybe simpler, but harder in so many ways. Change will always bring resistance in your life. It will invite that next layer of resistance and opposition in your life. And let me be clear, guys. Let me, let me be clear right here. Jesus alone saves us. That's not what we're talking about. Jesus alone saves us. That's about salvation. But this process of moving from old to new, he invites us in. Every day, small changes, and we call this big word sanctification, right? Jesus alone saves us in salvation, but that process of being invited into a different way of life each day, guys, we are becoming new creations. That's good news today. And also, let me be clear, guys, we don't change so people can love us more or God can love us more. We actually change because we love God and because we love people. Let me mess you up with this statement. We don't change for love, we change from love. Let me give you an example. When my wife goes away for a couple days, I, I'm excited that she gets away. Any moms in the room? And you're just like, okay, yes. Like, you know it's not gonna be pretty, but we are gonna get it done, right? Like, it's not gonna be pretty, that's not the expectation. So, a pr- well, okay, I, I learned a couple of times that she doesn't like to walk back in and there's like the leaning tower of dishes that's going on and they're all caked on, they've been there for a long time and it's like, well, what have you been doing the whole time? Like she's not saying this, but I, I read her eyes. I've made a mistake here. I've made a mistake, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not the smartest, but I know, I know what that statement is saying right there. Uh, and then I'm like, huh, like m- maybe I actually killed some of the gift by not giving her the gift when she walked back in. So then I adjusted my actions completely different. One hour before she returned, all hell breaks loose. My workout pants are coming on. My kids, I don't care what you're doing. We are all on. And she walks in. I mean, I'm just, just sweating. <laughs> hey, great to see you. But like, we got it. I mean, minute or two ahead, the timing was perfect, right? I have changed, not because I'm scared of my wife, but because I love my wife. And I want good things for her. 
Guys, we, we don't change for love, we change from it. We are deeply and dearly loved by God. He loves us. He has good gifts for us. Guys, working for love says, if I change, maybe you will love me. Working from love says, because I love you, I am changing. Guys, Jesus brings freedom in our lives, but new patterns in our lives keep us free. Jesus makes us free, and then these new patterns keep us free. He invites us into the process. Guys, it's possible to be saved by Jesus, but still living in bondage. And these are the things that sometimes we don't hear. We don't hear in the church. This phrase has always stuck with me. We shape our habits, and then our habits shape us. So I I just want to ask you, what are your habits cultivating for you in your life? There are times when something that worked for us for a season no longer works to mature us in this next season. How are those habits, those daily rhythms working for you in your life? And sometimes we just feel a pain in one area of our life and maybe, just maybe, we're supposed to shift and change something over here. God, guys, I just want to remind you, God gives us this thing called self-control. This fruit of the Spirit. in our culture says, oh man, if you're feeling it, you have to do it. And let me just remind you that when emotion is high, intelligence is low. And when we try to make these decisions in the moment, and and we say, no, I pre-made this decision in my life. I'm not going to do this. And I'm going to live in this space. And these are the kind of things that I value. These are kind of things that I want and put into my lives. And God invites us into control. I'm not saying over-controlling or micromanaging life, but appropriate control, this fruit of the Spirit. What are you letting into your life? The little foxes that Scripture talks about. And these two men, they have moments of clarity and awareness, and they have a completely different response, right? They're starting similar, and I'm like, this is good. Don't we all love to hear a good transformation story? And like, yes, oh, this is going to happen. This is going to play out like a movie. One of them plays out like a mainstream movie, and one of them plays out like an independent film. And it's like, wah, wah, super sad, end of film. And I'm like, I don't like these, these independent films. I want that feeling, this change, this arc, this hero story inside of all of us. And guys, I've missed this many times. Let me just say this. I've missed it many times because, see, sometimes we're we're invited into courage and sometimes we choose cowardice. Here's my potential to change. I don't know. That's pretty early. I don't know if I can give that up. I, I don't know. For two years, guys, I resisted counseling. I've invited other people and said, I'm a big fan of counseling. Some of my friends are counselors and therapists. And I said, yeah, I believe in it in theory, but I had actually never been through it. I resisted it, I don't know, time, money, all the excuses, you've heard them before. And I went, man, I think my impact with other people and and my health and growth and my family is gonna be limited until I receive counseling, until I say, man, what what is this in my life? And so I resisted it for a few years and God is kind and he gives us retests along the way. And then to submit to a 26 month process of that and watch some things I didn't even know were issues bring them to light so I can pray through them, I can work through them. But the most important message, I think, in all of these two stories is contained in this one phrase. To this rich young man, Jesus looked at him and loved him, it says. Looked at him and loved him. Guys, on the other side of the courage to change is freedom. On the other side of that, so many times, We think, oh, like God wants us to change so we can be good. No, friends, God wants us to change so we can be free. So we can be free. He looks at us and loves us. It didn't say he had disdain for this man, so he told him to do all kinds of other things. He looked at him and loved it. He wanted it for him. Guys, God wants us to take next steps so we can be free. There's this tradition at the church that I'm part of. And it's called Set Free Sunday. And, and there's this cross up in the front, and it's very much a church for the margins, a very non-traditional church in many ways. 
uh, incredible addiction recovery processes, incredible things going on, serving the homeless. But uh, this one Sunday is the most favorite and notable of the whole year. And on Set Free Sunday, you are invited a couple weeks ahead of time to bring things that have been tripping you up and getting in the way that represent that. People bring all kinds of accoutrements and paraphernalia. Uh, anything that has caused an issue in their life, they bring it. In fact, there's a cop that comes after the service to be able to take all of those things afterwards. And people are like, I'm done with this. Like, this is my moment that the journey begins. And then it continues. And they're invited into processes and community and prayer and healing opportunities. But let me just say that sometimes the issue is we catch somebody in a snapshot of their life. And we believe that's the totality of who they are. Guys, don't let somebody catch you in a snapshot of your life and think this is exactly who they are. Don't catch somebody else in that snapshot and say, yeah, this is, this is who they are, the sum of their greatest mistake. But one of the problems that we see is we read scripture and we only see a snapshot. See, there's this guy that we've called Doubting Thomas. And he had a moment, a moment maybe where he was leaning in closer than the others. And I think we've gotten all wrong, it all wrong. You see, we see Thomas in the snapshot. What's interesting is we actually don't see these first two men again. We're not sure how they responded with that. We're not sure how they changed the world, their lives, their families, who knows. But this guy Thomas, the snapshot moment says that he's a doubter. And we should write him off. Guys, you know what the end of the story is? He went on to be a missionary to India, to plant many, many churches. And I believe he was one of the greatest missionaries to ever live. And, and I believe we should probably refer to him as Thomas the world changer, Thomas the bold, who went on to do incredible things. In fact, I was, I was speaking once and I mentioned Thomas and, and a man came up to me, his family's from India, and he said, my family is one of the four families that came from the line of the people who Thomas first converted. Shaman families that were converted and then the line of that, and he's still following Jesus today. I was like, goosebumps, mic drop. Like, isn't that amazing? I was like, thank you for telling me that, right? Because he chose in that moment to move the trajectory. He was hungry enough, careful to finding somebody by their worst moment. And friends, to know that in our lives, we are submitted to Jesus and so we are submitted to the process every day. Guys, when freedom's on the other side of a decision, just go ahead and expect fear. Just expect it. It's not a mark that you shouldn't do something. In fact, it could be the mark that you absolutely should. I wanna give you a couple of reminders about change. Sorry, guys, I'm really practical. I can't not give you some of these. First of all, start where you are. Start where you are. I probably should not start some huge exercise program, do CrossFit, and end up with some warrior race the next week. But probably not a good decision. Start where you are, friends. Resist a few things along the way, perhaps. Little actions make a big impact over time. Little actions, the compounding interest over time. Moments of awareness should lead us to these moments of action. When freedom's on the other side of a decision, just expect fear. And last, you need people around you to help you navigate change. Is I don't know any better place to do this than the body of Christ, than these people. Uh, among this imperfect but beautiful community that is called the church. And I wanna end by telling you a story in my own life that I didn't think I'd be telling from a stage ever. So 25 years ago, I did something that offended a friend of mine and our friendship was never the same. 25 years ago. And I never knew what I did. About every six months, I, I just think of that. And there's a little bit of regret. I'm just, ah, oh, what did I do? And I can't figure it out. And one Saturday morning, I'm sitting in my sweatpants, beautiful, calm morning. My kids are fighting and beating each other in the background, and things are happening. It's a super relaxing morning at our households. Uh, and I'm sitting in my sweatpants, and I think of that again. And in that moment, I thought, how long am I going to tolerate this? I am not free. I do not want to take this to the grave with me. And it's had a solid 25-year run, but not today. 
And I looked this person up, sent them a message. We had a short conversation. And then about 15 minutes later, friends, I was free. That was my set free Saturday. I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what's broken. I don't know what's misaligned. I don't know what is out of place in your life. But when there's that new awareness, guys, there's a new opportunity for an action. That We do something that Jesus calls us into this life with a next step. You guys are big about next steps here, right? Accelerate church like we're going somewhere. We're moving in the direction of faith. And I just want to leave you with two questions. I'm sorry if they mess with you later. Sorry, not sorry. But I want you to lean in on these questions. In what area have you become aware of your need to change? In what area of life is that? Maybe it's a gaping wound. Maybe it's a twinge like I was feeling. What area have you become aware? And secondly, what's your next step? What's your next step? I want to pray over you and for you. God, thank you that your son Jesus looks at us with love, wants freedom for us. God, we're not always going to get it right, and yet so many times when we do, there's freedom waiting right on the other side of that. God, I don't know the pain that folks are feeling in this room. I don't know the challenges. I don't know the resistance and the opposition, God, but I know they have it. And I want to pray against those, God. I want to pray for the work of your spirit. God, I thank you for a local church community at Accelerate that is supporting and that is moving in the direction of freedom, God. There is freedom on the other side. And for that thing right now that is holding them back, God, we pray that you give them the clarity. You give them the courage to take their next right steps and be people of faith in obedience. God, thank you for what you're doing right here in this locus, this particular place, in this particular time. You're doing something special through Accelerate, God. And as this work expands, we pray that it not only widens on a map, but it deepens in people's hearts as they accelerate their way toward Jesus and toward freedom. In your name, amen. Amen.